place so grateful for you being here and rallying around the word of God and the spirit of God listen when the word and the spirit come together it's good and it's so good to be in this place today well we're continuing in our study of God's characteristics I'm calling this series glory and we've been in it for several weeks now uh, some of you may be new we're going to try and get you caught up a little bit as we prepare for this morning but uh, what we're basically discussing is uh, the more that we look for God uh, we will see him if we understand who God is so the more we know of his attributes the more we will see him in the little things of life and in the big things of life and what we need is an awareness of God I don't know about you but I, I just have this hunger to be as Andy was talking about a few minutes ago struck in awe of who he is and so we're, we're kind of taking a look at who he is according to the scriptures we started talking of the greatness of God early on uh, how big and expansive he is we we made our way through the omnis of God and how he is everywhere all powerful all all present with us we talked about his compassion and we've talked about his grace and those things have been revealed to us of course through Jesus we talked last week, I think it was last week, of his mercy. Uh, his mercy has endured the generations. We saw it in Moses. We, we see it in the pregnancy of Mary. We see it today in our own lives, how badly we need his mercy. It's a triumph of mercy for us. Now, if, if you will, this morning, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Uh, again, sort of connecting to the Christmas story as we prepare for Christmas. And I'll, I'll get there here in just a second. Uh, may take me a second or two, but we'll get there. Uh, if, if you're a note taker this morning, you'll write down the title of the sermon is uh, The Dawn from on High. Uh, this idea that when uh, Jesus came to this earth, he burst onto the scene and he was from on high and he brought something very different, something very real to our lives. Uh, as you're turning there, have you ever heard the phrase it's just who he is or it's just who she is uh, a phrase that's often associated when someone has a certain characteristic that's just a part of them uh, maybe it's someone that's really really giving hey that's just who he is someone that always has an encouraging word or is uplifting that's just who she is I have a co-worker and whenever I reach out to this co-worker with a form of communication, she always responds the same way. Uh, it, she's always going to call me. It doesn't matter if I reach out with a text, an email, a direct message, a pigeon with a note on it. It does not matter. Five minutes later, she's going to call me. It's just who she is. She just loves to talk, and that's her way of communicating. Well, over and over again in the scriptures, we are shown something very special and particular about God is just who he is over and over we hear that God is love that God so loved that God has shown us love that God first loved us love is from God listen when it comes to love love isn't just what God does it's who he is he embodies Love. You and I have the opportunity this morning to get lost in the love of God. So going back to our springboard scripture in Exodus 34, uh, verses 6 and 7, where we're looking over these characteristics of God. Let me read to you again from that passage. Uh, God is, of course, revealing himself to Moses, beginning to show who he is. And here's what he says. The Lord, Yahweh, the Lord is a compassionate and gracious God slow to anger and abounding in faithful love that's the end of verse six now watch verse seven maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations forgiving iniquity rebellion and sin not leaving the guilty unpunished bringing the consequences of the father's iniquity on the children and grandchildren to the third and fourth generation but we see that phrase twice in our key passage this maintaining of faithful love, this abounding in faithful love. Now, how many of you in here this morning have the New International Version, the NIV translation of the Scripture? I see a few hands. How about uh, New American Standard? Any of you folks in the house? All right. How about you old schoolers, King James? Come on, let me hear you. Where you at, King James? Yep, there's a couple of you. ESV, English Standard Version? Yep, 
All right, great. I read, I'm going to read here just, or I read from that passage, uh, uh, the Christian Standard Bible. Here's, here's the crazy thing. If we went around the room and had everybody read from their translation, when it comes to this particular passage, not any translation is the same. NIV, you guys saw it. It's translated, translated as unfailing love. CSB on the screen was faithful love. King James Version was goodness and then mercy. New King James, also the same. New American Standard, faithfulness, ESV, steadfast love. Others will say loyal love. What's going on here? Let me tell you, anytime you see a, a passage in Scripture where the translations are, are struggling to get at the heart of it, there's something unique and special. The, the Hebrew word here is the word chesed, all right? You need to practice that, not, not right now, because in your mass that's going to be gross, but, but he, he, I can't even do it. He, we're just going to go with hesed, all right? Hesed is a Hebrew word that has all sorts of rich meaning to it. The reason that you have different translations is in English, we're struggling. Let's get our minds and hearts wrapped around this word. And, and it's really hard because it's not a normal love that you hear of today, especially in today's culture and the society that we live in. Uh, the word love takes on just some real superficial meanings. Th this, isn't, th this isn't the love that you hear about in some pop music like uh, Beyonce's Crazy in Love or anything like that. Th this is a love that's deep. It's the kind of love that demonstrates when someone is keeping a promise, when, when there's a desire to be loyal to the promise that person's love is going to go above and beyond this this love is extremely generous in other words hesed just to kind of sum it up it's the emotion of love and it's generosity and it's commitment all wrapped up into one it is a fantastic word in other words when god's describing himself here at the very very beginning revealing himself to moses he is saying, I abound in a love that will not fail. It's a love that's going into action. It's a love that has a future. It's a love that's going to serve. He is revealing his characteristics to us this morning. Love isn't just what God does. It's who he is. And we find that to be true, do we not? As we walk through the redemptive story throughout the scriptures we see that love early on but then we get to passages oh like john 3 16 where it says for god so for god so loved the world that he gave his one and only son oh it's a love that's going to go through the generations it's a love that has eternity in mind as a matter of fact in Romans 5 8 we know that God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were sinners Christ died for us yeah it's it's a faithful love that God has given so this Hebrew word hesed in the Old Testament you get into the New Testament where it turns into a Greek language and we see those love words and those very familiar passages that word becomes agape and there's different words for love, and you, most of you have heard those before, but the word agape is this sacrificial love. So this faithful love kind of becomes this, this sacrificial love as this story is played out of God's pursuit to you. His love had a beginning. His love had a purpose. It's not a passive love. It's not a God saying, oh, I love you, now go and, and do whatever. It is not a passive, it is a proactive love that's going to pursue you and change things in your life because God's love redeems you. It buys you out of your sin and your shame and gives you a hope and a future. And that's why when we get to verses like Luke 1, chapter 1, verses 78 and 79, we begin to understand a little bit more of this Christmas story of love coming to earth. A very pregnant Mary uh, visits her relative Elizabeth. Elizabeth also is pregnant. Mary stays with her for three months. Elizabeth's husband, Zechariah, is in charge of this household of two pregnant ladies. Poor Zechariah, right? Two pregnant ladies in the house. How do you find enough pickles and ice cream for this mess, right? 
So Zechariah is here and he's, he's taking all of what's happening in. Mary pregnant with the Savior of the world and then Elizabeth, his wife pregnant. And, 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 and he begins to prophesy over his own son. He recognizes what God is doing in Mary's life. He, he understands the Savior of the world has come. And, and now he prophesies over his own son, who we know to be as John the Baptist. And, and he is going to be someone that prepares the way. Uh, he's going to be one that uh, uh, proclaims who Jesus is to the people around. And so here's what he says in verses 78 and verses 79. Because of our God's merciful compassion, the dawn from on high will visit us to shine on those who live in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Oh, this love is going to bring something very special to this earth. So if you're keeping notes with me this morning, write this down. Number one, faithful love brings newness. Faithful love brings newness. You see, when love comes into your life, it creates something new. Zechariah is uh, recognizing this. When this love comes to earth, it, it's going to bring something new and exciting. The dawn from on high is coming into our lives. This faithful sacrificial love will change us. And that's exactly what happens, right? When, when we experience a love like that, you know, I've got two, Melissa and I have two boys uh, right now, and, and one of them married a year, one of them having a serious girlfriend. We're standing back and we're watching this just kind of chuckling from a distance because love changes you. It changes how you operate. It changes how you spend your money. It changes what you do with your time, think of those activities that you love. You invest, you think about, you work towards those kinds of things. That's what love does. It brings newness. And here we're being told that a new day is on its way. And sure enough, as this story unfolds, we find that the repenting of sin and the following of Jesus brings all sorts of newness into our lives. It begins to change who we are at our very core because of God's faithful love inhabiting our hearts and our souls. Write this down as well. Number two, faithful love is infinite. What God is describing here of himself is a love that will not end. Uh, it's, it's a steadfast love that does not stop. You, you hear tones of it throughout the scriptures of how love cannot be conquered, it cannot be changed, it has no boundaries, right? No height, no depth. It's, it's in all of its fullness, it comes into your life. It does not run out, it does not run dry. You can't stop it, you can't break it off, you can't run from it, it will not let go. It reminds me of the story of Hosea and Gomer in the Old Testament, that prophet, the man of God, told to go and marry a prostitute, a woman living in great sin. And he goes, marries the prostitute, brings her into his home. She goes back to her old way. She's on the run doing some of those same things. And he takes off and goes after her, looking to marry her. Why? It's an illustration of God's love for you and me. We prostitute ourselves with this world. We fall in love with all sorts of things. We fall into idolatry with the things of this world, but God's love does not stop. It is infinitely pursuing you and me. That ought to give us some great encouragement in the house today. Number three, Number three, faithful love shines. That's what Zechariah is saying. When darkness and death surround, there needs to be this higher love that shines through. God's merciful compassion breaks through the darkest of nights. I, I talked this week with a man who lost his ministry position, called into an office on Monday morning without any sort of warning, was just told he was being let go. You, you may have experienced that yourself when you've been fired from a job. He, I can't imagine the uh, lack of value, the, uh, the uncertainty that begins to flood over a soul that has to walk through that. What, what's going to carry you through during those moments? I talked with a young lady this week 
who experienced a miscarriage, lost her baby, great sorrow, great loss, walking through death and those shadows, what's going to carry you through? Think of when your spouse says, I don't love you anymore, and just walks out the door. Think of when there's a problem in a group of people, maybe even within the church, where there's some sort of disunity or disharmony and people that once really took care of each other are now at odds. What is going to carry you through those moments? Someone needs to be saying, I have a faithful love. I've got great news for you. It is God Almighty who speaks down into your soul and says, I haven't given up on you. I'm right there with you. God gives us faithfulness and sacrifice that whatever darkness we walk through, whatever, whatever death we walk through, there is a light of hope, a great big God who passionately has affection for you. And you and I can say to ourselves, I, I turn to him. I can turn to him. There is something for me in this great God who loves me so. Number four. You can write this down. Faithful love guides us to peace. Zechariah mentions this in his passage. It guides us to peace. Peace, of course, being wholeness. Uh, lack of peace being a chaos, but it's division. It's a warring in our minds. It's a warring in our hearts. It's a, it's a disturbance in our soul. What God intends for us is to have a peace that comes out of, born out of his great love and sacrifice for us. Have you ever been around a child that does not have a good, solid foundation of love in the home? If you're an educator in the room, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There's these kids that come out of these, these places where uh, they, they just don't have that kind of love, faithful love. There's abandonment or, or, or there's serious harm and abuse. If you watch them, they cry out. For love, They express a need for love in all sorts of ways. That's a child in turmoil. Why? Because we hunger, all of us hunger. We need love in our lives. And when it's there, when it's present, we feel safe and we feel secure and we are satisfied. God today says, I have everlasting love for you. There is peace when you wrap yourself in my love. Now, it's a kid's movie. I get this, but we're all kids at heart. There's a story out there called Finding Nemo. It's from way back. So some of the kids in the room just perked up. They're like, yeah, I can dig this. This is for you. I've included this just for kids this morning and myself. Nemo is this young, energetic clownfish um, he's lost his mom, he just has his dad, he's eager, he's friendly, he's adventurous, he doesn't much like his father's rules because his father's pretty protective of Nemo, and so uh, he gives out a bunch of rules, the father gives out a bunch of rules of what he can and can't do, and this, of course, frustrates Nemo to the point, at one point in the movie, he even says, I hate you, to his father, tries to push his father away and begins to live on the edge uh, against the rules, which of course gets him captured, right? And so here he was living in this beautiful reef in the ocean, all sorts of colors and protection, and, and now he finds himself captured and living in a fishbowl in a dentist's office watching root canals, right? There's another sermon in that. But what happens is Marlon, the father, passionately pursues his son. He takes off on this great adventure with his good friend Dory, whom we all love, and they take off trying to find Nemo, wherever he is, and they swim against the Australian currents in this expansive ocean looking for his son. They face sharks. They face stingrays. They face these possessive birds that scream out at them, mine, 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 wanting to eat them, right? All because he wants his son back. At one point, Marlon, the father, says, um, I promised him, Nemo, that I would never let anything happen to him. 
To which Dory responds, that's a funny thing to promise. If you can't let anything happen to him, then nothing would ever happen to him. God has not promised that life would be easy, but he has promised that his love would be faithful in the midst of darkness, in the midst of death, through all of it, his love pursues us. So let's apply this to our own lives. Let's not just walk out of here with a great feeling of God's love, which I hope he's speaking into your hearts right now. But let's apply this in a few ways. Number one, Love freely because God first loved you. You and I, because we experience that kind of love, it's a unique, special love. Because we experience it, though, we can go out and give it away. And here's my encouragement for us today. Let's go ahead and do that. Let's go ahead and just give love away in this old, cruel world that needs so desperately to see it. We are so reserved today in our churches, in our walk, because of the times that we're living in, the hurt, the division. It it almost seems like the love of God is just bottled up. What if we decided we may not agree with his or her opinions, we may not uh, have the same kind of values, but I'm going to love through thick and thin. Because there's a lot of desperate people who are in search of true love. If, if someone comes up to you from El Dorado, Arkansas, and they ask for a recommendation to a restaurant, you don't send them, like, off to Wisconsin, right? If someone asks you for a, a, a hammer, you don't give them a screwdriver. If people are asking us what love really, really is, let's go ahead and point them to the truth that God is an eternal, everlasting steadfast, faithful love. Let's just go ahead and give that away. Number two, let's demonstrate love. And we have been shown in the passages of Scripture that love is demonstrated mostly through sacrifice. In our own families, we know that to be true. So let's give up some time. Let's give up some finances, some energy. Let's give up some of our agenda and, and get outside of ourselves and do some sacrificial love work for someone in our midst. There are people out there that need it. Old Bob Dylan, he might have had something when he said, I'd go hungry, I'd go black and blue, I'd go crawling down the avenue. That is sacrificial love. What if we showed that to a cold world? Number three, let's be faithful to someone because God is faithful to you. <clears throat> is there someone that you're thinking about giving up on, you're just going to wash your hands of it. Now listen, yes, your relationship may change, the circumstances of all of that may change, but don't hate her, don't hate him. Let's have at least a faithful kind of love in the midst of that. God doesn't hate you if you know him to be true. Is there a group of folks that you're thinking about giving up on? Maybe you've just become disenchanted with who they are. Again, some things may need to change in those circumstances, but at least be loyal in your affections for them. The dawn from on high is Jesus. God's hesed in human form. What God said in Exodus comes true when he maintains that love through Jesus to a thousand generations, and here we sit today basking in the glow of God's great love because here's the truth. You you and me, we're, we're Jacob. We're full of lies and deceit and all sorts of wrong choices, yet God in his love made him the ruler of the 12 tribes that became Israel to which God's love would be poured out. We're Jacob. Truth is, we're David. We're, we're full of adultery and immorality and even murder, and God made him a king out of his love. We're, we're Gomer, who prostitutes herself while the prophet pursues. We're Peter, the denier. We're Thomas, the doubter. We're Paul, the persecutor, if we really take a good look at ourselves. 
but God's love finds us in the midst of that. And he tells us, you can trust in me and you can follow me because I have deep, great affection for you. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? And just in a quiet of a moment, I want to, I want to read to you a quote from A.W. Tozer who says it this way. Listen to what he says. So tremendous. God has a heart for you. Self-sufficient as he is, he wants our love and will not be satisfied till he gets it. Free as God is, he bound his heart to us forever. His love is active. It draws us to himself. Is God drawing you this morning? Do you need a love like that in your life? You're lost. You have no idea what true love really looks like. Would you come during these moments of invitation and reflection? I'd love to talk to you about how much God loves you, what he did for you in sacrificing on a cross so that you could get past your sin and know him. The staff here would love to talk with you. Several good friends probably in the house that would do the same. But what about it, believer? What, what are we doing with our love? Do you know that God so loved you so that you could give it away? How can we give it away this week? Let's think about that as we sing and reflect this morning. Oh God, your love washes over us wave after wave after wave. It does not stop. You pursue us and give us a great hope and peace. We can be solid and secure in you. Because you treat us, you call us your children. God, we're so grateful for that this morning. Lord, help us as we, as we follow you to share that love with others, that they may see all of who you are. God, it's just who you are. You are love. So thankful, God, that you share it with us through this amazing grace of Jesus on the cross. And it's in his name that we pray these things. Amen.